<laughs> All right, um, let's get uh, started. Good afternoon, everyone. It's great to see a large turnout today, and uh, welcome to today's theoretically speaking presentation, uh, whose title is Machine Check Proofs and the Rise of Formal Methods in Mathematics. So, my name is Venkat Guruswamy. I'm a senior scientist uh, here at the Simons Institute and also an acting, acting interim director of the semester. Um, so just a brief introduction to the Simons Institute. Uh, the Simons Institute is the leading international venue for collaborative research in theoretical computer science and related fields. Uh, it was established in 2012 with a very generous grant from the Simons Foundation, which continues to support us. Um, the Institute's model is it brings together the world's leading researchers in theory of computing related fields, as well as the next generation of outstanding young scholars, postdocs, visiting students, fellows, and so on. And the the main mode of operation is to have thematic semester programs. There are usually two of them run in parallel. And, uh, but we also run a lot of uh, outreach activities with the goal of popularizing algorithmic thinking and, and its importance in addressing current um, day challenges. And one such series is the theoretically speaking series. And the idea here is to um, uh, highlight exciting advances in theory of computing algorithms all broadly construed. Uh, for a broad audience, so the topics of sort of of general interest and uh, and you know the talks sometimes even attract high school students and you know it's supposed to be generally accessible. And I'm very excited to uh, introduce uh, today's theoretically speaking uh, uh, speaker uh, today, who's Leonardo Di Mora. So I'll give a brief uh, bio of him and, and then leave. Uh, leave let him give the talk. So Leonardo is a senior principal applied scientist in the automated reasoning group at AWS. And in his spare time, he serves as the chief architect and member of the board of directors of the Lean FRO, Focus Research Organization, which is a nonprofit organization uh, that uh, he co-founded with Sebastian Ulrich. And uh, before joining AWS uh, this year, uh, he was a senior principal researcher in the RISE group at Microsoft Research, uh, uh, where he worked for 17 years. And his research areas span many topics, including automated reasoning, theorem proving, decision procedures, SAT, and SMT. And he's the main architect of Lean, which is an open source theorem prover and programming language, as well as Z3 and Yikes 1.0, which are both SMT solvers as well as um, SAL or Symbolic Analysis Laboratory, which is an open source tool that includes symbolic and bounded model checkers. And uh, today's talk will be on formal methods in mathematics for you know, machine assisted proofs uh, and so on. And, uh, and I just want to say that it's, it's quite remarkable that we are at a point today where you can, in a reasonable span of time, code up, formalize, and verify the highest level of uh, mathematical research. And I think, I mean, some of seeing some of these developments in the last couple of years, I've been quite astounded. And therefore, it's a great pleasure today to uh, invite uh, Leonardo Di Mora to tell us about uh, uh, this, this journey. And I'm sure there's a lot more to come in this space in the years ahead. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for, for the introduction, Venkat, and for the invitation. I'm very happy to be here. Uh, our story starts with formal methods, right? Uh, I'm actually not a mathematician. I'm a computer scientist, and my area of expertise is formal methods, right? In formal methods, we specify, we design, and verify complex systems with mathematical rigor, right? We may use automated provers or, or interactive ones. Uh, but here's an example, right? What do I... Uh, what I mean by specification. You can write, for example, a very simple specification for the, uh, a function that returns the maximum of two numbers, right? This specification has three parameters, A and B, the inputs and the results. And the spec here is basically saying the result should be greater than or equal to A, right? Should be greater than or equal to B, and it should be equal to A or B, right? And then we have the design, the, the actual function, our implementation in this case. And we have the verification step where we, we are proving that this, our implementation satisfies the specification, right? 
of course, we may make mistakes in the specification, right? And we may, this is a common thing, a common question people ask us, right? You may be proving the wrong thing. Your specification may be wrong, but you can test specifications too, right? How do we test? We start proving properties about our specifications. We, we may say, well, suppose that we specify the real numbers. We may try to prove the real numbers form a real algebra, real closed algebraic fields, right? Uh, and you can make this test for everything. You can prove properties about your specifications. You can inspect them. And you're going to see later today that you can use tools to navigate these specifications and increase your confidence that they are correct. But the cool thing about formal proofs right, is that they are machine checkable, right? You can write a small program that can check formal proofs, right? Formal proofs, they have a lot of detail, right? They may be tedious to write by hand, but today you have machines that can assist us creating formal proofs, and we have these small trusted proof checkers. We can have many of them, right? Here I have a very simple proof, right? Basically showing that if you have A equals B and C equals B, you can prove that A equals C, right? How do we do that? You can see that the actual proof looks like a program, right? I basically, H2 here, you can view as a, uh, as a certificate or, 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 or evidence that C equals B. Since you have evidence that C equals B, we are giving a name to the evidence, you're calling it H2. We can use symmetry to get now evidence that B equals C. And now that we have evidence, we have H1, that's evidence that A equals B, and we have evidence that B equals C, we can get a proof. The transitivity gives you a proof that A equals C, right? This is a formal proof in our system that we are going to study today. And why machine uh, checkable proofs are relevant for mathematics? We claim they are the ultimate democratizer, right? The things now, when you have a formal proof, nobody should take on faith or authority the things you say, right? It doesn't matter who you were, where you came from. If your proof can be checked, everybody can build on top of it, right? It addresses the trust bottleneck, not just the trust between humans, right? Sometimes we see very tiny groups, maybe only two mathematicians working together because they don't trust each other. They, they are working with their close collaborators. Machine checkable proofs allow people that never met to work together. And now with AI, right, that's coming from mathematics too, we will address the, bot the trust bottleneck between humans and machines. Right. With machine checkable proofs, you, you don't need to trust the AI. You can give the spec. You only have to be sure that your spec is correct. If it produces a proof, right, you don't need to check it. If it's a formal proof, you can check if it is a small trusted program, the proof checker. Uh, Lean is the proof assistance we built, right? It is the work of many, many different people, right? There are many, many different contributors, right? It's based on dependence type theory. The main goals for the project are extensibility. And I will emphasize that because extensibility is the most important one. We, for, for almost, we started the project 10 years ago with very little resources. Only now we have a foundation that's, we can hire engineers to work on this project. Having an extensible system allows the community to co contribute to the system. We do not have to coordinate. They can extend the system independently of our wishes as the developers of the system. We want an expressive system, a system that you can express modern mathematics. Dependence type theory is powerful enough for that. Scalability is really important. A huge mathematical library is a beast, right? It's a big software system. And efficiency is also important. So nobody wants to keep waiting the system to check your proofs or to what should I do next? Uh, you want instantaneous reaction. A common complaint we get from mathematicians is this is too slow. I have to wait. 
and you have to go back and try to make things faster. Uh, you may ask, Lean may have bugs. Yes, it may have bugs, but you only need to trust the proof checker. You may have a huge system to assist humans creating these proofs. You can put AI in the mix, you can have graphical user interfaces, you can have databases, but in the end, you have a formal proof and this formal proof is checked by a small program. We believe Lean is a platform for formalized mathematics, right? software development and verification, and also a platform for developing new proof automation in domain-specific languages. We have this small trusted kernel, this proof checker, and we support external type and proof checkers. This is important, right? So our Kernel may be small, but it may contain bugs. You, you, you address this issue by allowing people to implement their own checkers, right? Here is an example of, a, 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 I'm putting it just to give you a flavor of how a Lean proof looks like. You can view Lean as a development environment for formal methods, right? All your proofs and definitions are machine checkable. The math community using Lean is growing rapidly, right? I never expected that. I mean, originally we want you, the main customer of Lean, we expect it should be software developers that want to verify their software. We still want, care about software verification. We thought some of the magicians would care about this kind of system, but we never expected that they would like so much the system. Right. You can also see Lean as a compiler for mathematics now, right? You have a high-level language. This language that the kernel accepts is like assembly language for mathematics. Nobody wants to write proofs in this language. They create their own notations. We provide notations for them to, to operate the system in a high level of abstraction. And Lean is compiling this high-level language that's not just designed by us, but by our users too to this low level kernel language. And of course, they use integrated development environments, these editors that developers use to write code is the same editors, right? That people used to write code, mathematicians now use to write proofs. Here's an example of Lean for, for formal mathematics. I got a, a piece of math lib, just to give you an idea. This is a result from the Stacks library Right, Stacks is this big open source book at Columbia University. Right, it is huge. Right, and it's really hard to find results there. By having the formal versions, you get many benefits. One benefit: you make sure the proofs are correct. This is great, but it's more than that, because by making mathematics into formal, moving from informal to formal, math now is also data. You can search. It's easier to search. It's easier to track dependencies. It's easy to refactor your code. You, you can build dependency graphs. You can do, you can analyze the structure of your proofs. You can write meta programs, programs that traverse your definitions, right? And here you can see how rich you have commutative rings, submodules, ideals, module, additive code commutative groups, you have all these elements being used to, to state this theorem. Uh, a question that we get all the time, should we trust Lean, right? Uh, maybe it's full of bugs. Yes, it's full of bugs. It's a huge system with contributions from many different people, right? But we don't need to trust the whole system. You only need to trust the checker, right? But the checker may have bugs. Our checker may have bugs. But you don't need to trust it. You can export your proof, right? And you can use external checkers. Over the years, many checkers have been implemented for Lean, for Haskell, Scala, Rust, and so on. Now, in the latest version, we are porting many of these checkers to the latest version. Uh, and this is important. We really believe this is the way to achieve, to make sure our results are correct. Right, to make sure the mathematicians trust the system, they are not concerned that they are proving something that's not true. And finally, you can implement your own checker. 
many people do that, right? Some of these checkers were written by students. Like some students want to understand how the theory works, right? And the best way to understand it is to implement your own checker, right? It's a fun activity. So this Haskell uh, was a friend of mine. He implemented one week this checker in Haskell. And Lean will enable decentralized collaboration, right? As I said, Lean is an extensible system, right? And there are two main pillars that support decentralized collaboration in Lean. One is metaprogramming. Metaprogramming is that you can extend Lean using Lean itself, right? You can write Lean programs, right? That's a mathematical definitions. Lean functions, that's a mathematical definitions. Uh, some Lean functions are proofs. And some Lean functions are Lean extensions, right? They are new proof automation. They are visualization tools, new custom notation, or uh, refactoring tools. We can do that all in Lean. This graph here, this dependency graph, was created by the community, right? For, uh, they formalize as a result. They want to see how the dependency graph is for these results, and the, they auto-generate this graph, just tracking. Again, math is data. Formal math is data. You can track the dependencies. You know which lemmas a term is using, and you can check which lemmas these lemmas are using. You can keep going back, 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 until you get back to axioms. You can track all the dependencies, and you can use color codes for the modules these dependencies come from. This is very powerful, right? I didn't implement, I mean, none of my colleagues that helped me develop Lean implemented this graph. It was implemented by the community. Formal proofs, right? This is the second ingredient, right? Formal proofs, as I said, they, uh, they are the ultimate democratizer. You don't need to trust me to use my proofs, right? You don't need to trust my proof automation to use it. We say, like in the Rust community, you can hack without fear. You can create a new kind of proof automation. Without fear, you may be introducing unsoundness. You are adding a bug to the system. Suppose that you write a proof automation that is buggy. What will happen? It will create a proof. When this proof goes to the kernel, to the proof checker, the checker is going to say, this is an invalid proof. And people will realize that the automation you built is incorrect. If it has so many bugs, people will stop using your automation. Sometimes buggy automation is useful. If it works most of the time, some people will use it anyway because they, it's making them more productive. So formal proofs are a key, right? It allows you to implement proof automation without worrying if it always works. You can call sometimes external tools to construct these proofs. Implement it in a completely different language. In the end, you only care about the certificate, this formal proof. The mathematical library, right, is called MathLibinLin. It's developed by a huge community. Right. This is the picture. These are just the maintainers. There are way more people. There are more than 300 people that contributed to the library. The Lean Mathematical Library, they have a paper where it's impossible to list all the authors, right? So it takes several pages. They just say the MathLib community as the author of this, of this paper. Here's some statistics. The library has more than 1 million lines of code, right? It started in 2017, has more than 100,000 theorems and the contributions for, from more than 300 people. The library is the foundation of many other projects, like the Perfectoid Spaces. These projects popularized Lean. In 2018, Kevin Buzzard said, well, other proof systems formalized important results in mathematics. But these results are not fashionable anymore. There's nobody working on these results. They are important, but they're results from the past. Perfectoid space is a hot area. In 2018, Peter shows it got a Fields Medal, right? And everybody wants to understand what a perfectoid space because he worked in this area. He created this concept. 
And in math overflow, you can find this question. What are perfectoid spaces? The second most voted question is a link to the lean developments, right? Basically, the answer is a perfectoid space is a type in lean. And this, these developments, you go there, you can navigate the results, right? Now, it, it's almost like a browser. For example, uh, uh, the picture here is a little small, but it says that a perfectoid space depend on, depends on something called a Tate ring. You may not know what Tate ring is, but you can ask Lin, jump to the definition of Tate ring, and you can read what a Tate ring is. Maybe it's defined using all the things you don't know, and you can keep digging, digging, and learning until you fully understand what a perfectoid space is. There's no, I mean, sometimes when people give explanations in informal math, they, they remove the details. They can go back to the axioms, right? So otherwise the explanation would be enormous, right? Nobody would read it. It's hard to, to modulate how precise should we be. Informal math, this problem doesn't exist. You can keep digging, digging, asking for more and more details. And you can fully understand if you have patience, even if you do not have the background, but you have patience, you can understand anything, right? You can keep digging and finding more and more about these objects. And this attracted many, this project attracted many mathematicians to the Lean community. Today, the Lean ecosystem has the mathematicians where with many projects like MathLib, Flypitch, Lean Perfectoid Spaces, the Formal Abstracts projects, there are many projects there, but there's a lot of activity in AI. I will go back to AI later today. Uh, there are also software developers. That's uh, a language that's great for math. It's also a, a language that's great for programming. The people that use Lean for many different applications for checking protocols, controlling robots, and so on. And we also strongly believe that formal mathematics is also useful for math education, right? I meet all the time young students that learn to program by themselves, right? Without any help, they keep reading tutorials, playing online. They can play, they have a playground, an interpreter, a compiler, that they can run programs and tests and, and play with it. For math, it is harder, right? Usually you have to have a mentor, someone that tells you, this is a proof, this is not a valid argument, this is not rigorous, this is incorrect. You need someone to guide you until now. Now you can do math like you program, right? It's funny, all these students that learn to program themselves, it's really easy to teach them to use formal mathematics. Some of them say, I don't know what a proof is. You sit one afternoon with them, they will learn what a proof is. It's very similar to programming. The Lean's Leap channel is where the community gathers. There are many streams there and people interact. You're going to find all different sorts of people there. You find students commemorating their achievements, like, oh, I did my bachelor dissertation using Lean or asking basic questions. But you also find Peter Schoese there, working with people, formalizing the liquid tensor experiments. You find AI people talking about building AI for mathematics on top of Lean, and so on. Uh, in 2020 was the year that Lean starts becoming very popular. Uh, we had an article in the Quanta and Wired magazines talking about the mathematical library. And Quanta uh, selected Lean as one of the biggest breakthroughs in math and computer science. They interviewed many, many different members of the community, from young students to established mathematicians. It, it, it gave me a boost to work harder in Lean. Many quotes there. Uh, I was really happy with many of the quotes from people from the community. It was the first time I realized the power of the community how people together can achieve more. In 2021, we had the liquid tensor experiment when Peter Schultz posed this challenge. He had this new result. He claimed that it was the most re important result of his career. He already had a Fields Medal by then. And he was saying, I have a new result. I'm unsure about this result. 
I have my lecture notes. People are using them and nobody's checking the proof. I'm not sure about the proof. And he posed this challenge. Can you check this proof using formal mathematics? Right. And uh, I remember when Kevin and uh, uh, approached me saying they were do, going to do it. Uh, they were conjecturing that it would take years to formalize this kind of mathematics, right? This cutting edge math that's not even Peter shows he could keep every all the details on his head, right? But people in a few months they managed to prove the main result he wasn't sure about, and after several months they formalized the whole thing. The other development showed up in Nature News, and it was, I think, the, the biggest achievement up to that point. Uh, this is talk about Johan Comelin. He led the formalization efforts. This is an amazing talk. I invite all of you to go there and watch. It's available online. It's an amazing talk. Uh, and it shows how you can approach mathematics as an engineer. Johan doesn't know, but he's an amazing engineer. He modularizes everything. He created the right specifications. The, the, he defined the right abstraction boundaries. After he did that, he could parallelize the community. You could say, you prove that, you prove this, you prove that. And everybody could work in parallel. Right? And there are many takeaways right, from this project. It's not just about we check the proof, but also the main takeaway that from mathematics is a tool for reducing the cognitive loads, right? It's not just about raw proof complexity, right? It's discrepancies, discrepancies between statements and proofs, missing side conditions, unstated assumptions, right? There are many tiny errors here and there. Johan told me that in many, in many, many different proofs, he could see only two steps ahead. He only managed to do it because there's a computer next to him, helping him. He can see the proof state. He can inspect the proof state. He looks at the informal proof. He couldn't make sense of it using pen and paper. But with a computer, he managed to do it. He just not checked the proof, he and his team. He simplifies the proof. This is mind-blowing when they told shows that they simplified the proof without fully understanding the proof. It's insane. It's because you have a computer next to you assisting you along the way. Uh, and also, these also impact how mathematics is done. This is new results, right, from, from Thomas Bloom. They formalized the results before it was refereed. Right. And you have a tweet from Tim Gowers, the Fields Medalist, saying, oh, wow, it's the first time I see this happening. The result has been formalized before he was refereed. Right? Maybe the sign of things to come, he finishes his sentence. Another interesting project is the sphere reversion project. Right? Is that you can uh, uh, flip the, uh, the sphere inside out Many people were wondering if it's even possible to do that in a proof assistance. How do you do this kind of proof in a proof assistance? It is just, uh, many people conjecture that proof assistance will work, will work only well for number theory, algebra, for, for things like geometric top, topology, they were wondering if it would work or not. They not only succeeded, but they, design new ways to attack this problem. And also they used this system that was also built by the community, the blueprints. The blueprints allows you to create a bridge between the informal and formal worlds. This blueprint has been used in the sphere reversion projects in the liquid tensor in the, the previous one by Thomas Bloom. It allows you to visualize the result as you would a regular uh, math results using formal mathematics, but it has links for the formal version and maintains them in sync. Right. Uh, 2003 has been a great year for Lean. I mean, it has been mentioned in the New York Times. Terence Tao mentioned it. It was in Quanta Magazine again, right? Because of the importance of 
formal mathematics and AI. But this is a strong relationship. I will tell you more about that later. Uh, the mathematical library was also ported to Lean4, the latest version. Lean4 is a big redesign of the Lean system, right? It's a much more powerful version, but it's incompatible with the previous one. When we started Lean4, MathLib was tiny. We never imagined. When we started Lean4, developing Lean4, MathLib was like 40,000 lines of code. We thought, well, it's going to be not going to be backward compatible, but we can port everything by hand, right? It's, it's not a big deal, 40,000 lines. We have, each one of us can port a few thousands. We will be done in one month. But we never expected that it would be more than 1 million lines, right? It would grow so rapidly. And everybody, I lost count how many people would come to me and say, this is going to be like Python 3 and Python 2. It's going to stay forever, two versions of Lean, because it will be impossible to port the whole library. I had doubts many times if, this, if it was going to be possible to port, but the community managed to port. They managed to post the whole library and they finished the post the same, at the same day that was the commemoration of the 10th of anniversary of the system. Uh, also, Lean has been used uh, recently for uh, cryptography. Daniel Bernstein is a famous cryptographer that formalizes GOPA codes using Lean. And also, Graydon Horst, the creator of Rust, was also motivating people to learn Lean and saying that he is really impressed with the system and is a powerful research language. Extensibility, let's talk a little bit about extensibility. I told you that we want to make Lean extensible. We want the community to extend the system and add their own features. Let's tell you how they do it. The first thing is MathLib is not just math. It's 1.2 million lines. But between 40,000 and 50,000 lines, they are meta programs. They are Lean extensions, right? The community extends Lean using Lean itself. Here's an example, the ring tactic for, for solving equations in ring theory is a tactic written by the community, right? It's a kind of proof automation written by the community. I'm just giving you a fragment, but this is Lean code. It's the same language you use for writing proofs and mathematical definitions, you can write extensions. Lean 4, because we want people to write their own extensions, their own proof automation, we also want it to be an efficient programming language. Just to give you an idea, the Lean Memory Manager is now the Bing Memory Manager. The Memory Manager was designed by Dan Lyon, a friend of mine. Dan designed it for Lean the Memory Manager. He never expected it. He, to be honest, we didn't care about Bing, right? Uh, 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 but it turns out that the Lean Memory Manager is great, reduce the latency of Bing, right? Bing responds more efficiently now because of the Memory Manager that's used in Lean. Lean also uses a technique called functional but in place. That he, functional programming languages are known to be inefficient but this recovers some of the efficiency we find in imperative programming languages. And proofs are not just for proving terms, you can also use proofs for optimizing your code. Yeah. And this is one thing that we want to keep pushing in this direction, making Lean a better and better programming language. In Lean, a big topic is domain-specific languages. We have many of them. Lean has an extensible parser, you may say, oh, why do you want accessible parser? It's because mathematicians love creating their own notations, right? And they want a system that you can do that, right? Uh, and making a system, having a hygienic macro system. Hygienic macro system is a macro system that you cannot accidentally capture names. You cannot write things that have tiny bugs. This is a high level description of a hygienic macro system. Yes. Our goal was simple extensions should be simple. Right? That was the goal. We want, if you want to write a simple notation, you're a mathematician, you want to write a simple notation, you should not have to read a lot 
of APIs should be very simple, right? And this infrastructure is used everywhere. Even for implementing, like we have this little language called, we call do notation for writing code that looks like imperative code in Lean, but it's just notation. Behind the scenes, it's functional codes. Lean is a pure functional language. This is just an illusion, right? It feels like I'm doing a destructive update here. It's just an illusion, right? It's just to make convenience for people to write codes, for writing their proof automation, and for us to write Lean itself. Lean is implemented in Lean. Lean 4 is implemented in Lean, and we use the notation that we create for the users ourselves to implement the system. Uh, and it's everywhere, right? The proof automation we write is using this do notation, right? This is uh, the automation we use for proving congruence lemmas. Congruence lemmas is when you have f of a equals f of b. Uh, sorry, when you have a equals b implies f of a equals f of b. It's the congruence rule, and we want to propagate these lemmas. And this is the piece of automation that creates these proofs for you. But right? it's written in Lean using the, that do notation I told you, I just told you about. We it's everywhere. You find this do notation everywhere. The patch framework, right? Also known as the synthesis framework, is a framework where you can create proofs using commands. You can say, I want to prove this theorem using induction, right? You have a command called induction. You can say, apply ACC intro. You're applying a result, a previous result. You can introduce a variable, right? All these building blocks, you have this notation call that starts with a by. When you say by in Lean, is you, you switch to this new domain-specific language. It's a domain-specific language language for automating proofs. And by the way, it's the most popular GSL in Lean. It's the most popular, with the mathematicians, they love this, this GSL. Uh, if you meet Kevin Buzzard or Patrick Masso they, or Johan, they would say, no, no, we love static framework. We love to, because it's like a playground. You can keep executing commands and seeing the results. You can see the new proof states. You can apply transformations to your proof states, manipulating the objects interactively, right? I mean, and they love this language. And you can extend yourself using Lean again. This is the, uh, the tactic, right? This is a proof automation for doing case analysis, again, implemented, implemented in Lean using the do notation, right? Users can write their own new primitives for the static language, like the ring tactic I showed you before. Everything is implemented in Lean. Uh, this is a, 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 a thing that I emphasize. Sometimes people say, oh, this is not a big deal. But convenience is key, right? Here, because you don't have to learn a new language, right? you, you do everything in Lean. Sometimes mathematicians in the same file they write proofs and proof automation in the same file. It's convenient to do that, and they love it. Convenience is super important in any system, any computer system. People want things, easy things to be easy, right? You have to remove all the roadblocks. If you had to compile a separate thing, dynamically link, learn a different language, it's too much work here, you make it super easy for someone to extend the system. And that's why they do it. There are many challenges ahead, right? Lean has one million lines, but if you want to keep up with modern mathematics, we estimate we would need to add 10 million lines per year, right? So this poses many, many challenges. And to attack these challenges, we now have the Folks Research Organization, the FRO. This is a concept created by convergent research as a new model for science. The key idea of convergence is that there are projects that you need a focus effort, right? We need engineers for long, a long period of time, right? You need a team, you need resources. 
This, and they claim this is too big for academia. Academia today is not prepared to have a huge team of engineers working on a project. And also for industry, some there are projects like Lean, there's no clear profitability path. Right? You're not going to make money building a system for mathematics. So who funds that? Right? And the FRO is a model for this kind of projects. We are just one, the Lean FRO is just one of the many FROs that exist today. There are 10, and many more will exist in the future. And the mission of the FRO is to address the scalability, usability, and proof automations in Lean. By the end of the year, we are going to have seven full time employees, and it is su supported by the Simons Foundation, the Alfred Sloan Foundation, and Richard Merkin. We are super grateful for their support, right? Maybe now it would be impossible to push the system. You reach the point that there are so many things. If you look at the issue tracker for the Lean project on GitHub, there are more than 500 issues. When you have real users, you have a, real, a bunch of issues, right? Any real project has tons and tons of issues. You need a team to address. There are people asking all sorts of improvements, features, uh, usability concerns, and you need a team to address that. And there's also scale. I mean, just this is a question uh, uh, Joseph Myers posted on Zulip, right? He asked, what will happen if MathLib is, the community is 100 times bigger, the library is 100 times bigger, and you have 100 times more commits? Right. What do we are going to? What you're going to do if this happens? Right. If it's 100 times bigger, it's going to be 120 million lines of code. This is bigger than most software systems. This is bigger than Windows. Right. Everything is complicated. Just building a project of this magnitude is complicated. Right. So scale is key. Right. How do you address scalability issues? Is a big problem. Right. Then you have to design new algorithms new data structures, they are engineering like, oh, we we're going to use memory mapped files, improving the code generator. Uh, I have a here a picture of the algebraic hierarchy. This is just a tiny fragment. It is gigantic. There are thousands of classes of mathematical objects in this hierarchy. Uh, automation, right? Mathematicians love to write proofs. Sometimes they are I get really uh, blown away on <coughs> the efforts they put writing these proofs. Keep in mind that in a system like Lean, you cannot say, this is obvious, I'm going to skip this step, right? You have to prove everything. You have proof automation to fill in the gaps, but the proof automation is not strong enough to cover every single, this is obvious you find in formal math. There are many steps in formal math that people say this is obvious, but we don't have meta programs, proof automation that can produce the proof automatically for this kind of step today, right? We need to improve that. There is something called the overhead factor or the De Bruyne factor. This is the overhead of using formal mathematics. When you compare results, right? You get the informal results and you compare with the formal version and how much bigger the formal version is. For the liquid tensor experiments, it's 20, right? It's a lot. It's 20 times. If you compare Shows's lecture notes with the formal version, it's 20 times bigger, right? And we want to make it smaller, right? As we keep, imagine if one day you can make it less than one. By making it formal, you, you, can, you can write less. That would be amazing, right? That would be unbelievable. Right? Usability is another thing, right? Uh, and there are many, many improvements of in, in this area, right? It's like many people from many different institutions helping us to get a great user interface. Here is showing the proof state. The proof state is not a, a fixed, it's an interactive object. You can start clicking and you can visualize these objects. You can visualize implicit information. You can make implicit information that you hide because you don't want to overload people with all the details, but you can start clicking and inspecting 
every single detail. And you have tools like, oh, jump to the definition, show me all the references of this, every place where this result is used. You can ask these questions. Right? You can use auto-completion like we use when you're programming. You are typing something and it shows you suggestions to auto-complete. All these features that you find in regular programming languages, you will find in Lean. Trace messages. You may say, what's a trace message? It's basically to show you the be what's happening behind the scenes. Sometimes the hardest part is understand when proof automation works, it's great, everybody's happy. But when it does not work, sometimes it's really tricky to understand why it didn't work. You expect, wow, I thought the proof automation would work here. Why it didn't work? Understanding why something didn't work is a big challenge. And trace, like a log of everything the prover did is important. But if this log is just a bunch of strings, it's really hard to navigate. Sometimes it's gigantic. But in Lean, the log is an object. It's a Lean object, like any term and definition. And you can browse it. It's an interactive object, too. You can search it, you can browse it, you can inspect it. And now you can also create your own visualizations for the mathematical objects. Uh, in this case, it actually is a red-black tree for computer science. Red-black tree is a data structure, it's a balanced tree, right, for storing elements. And you can have in logarithmic time, it finds if an element is there or not. And in Lean, now you can define your own visualization in Lean. You in, this, in this file, you are defining the visualization, right? You're defining how to visualize a red-black tree. And now when we're proving something about red-black trees, you have the proof states. You can select a term that represents red-black tree, and it will generate the graph automatically for you. It will generate a representation graphical visualization of the red-black tree. This is not hard-coded in the system. The user defined how they want to visualize the, system, the, the tree. Right. You can change. And this is a live object. For example, I'm, the, if I click here on Z, it's going to say, oh, Z has type alpha. Right. It's an interactive graphical representation of your object. And you can implement any visualization you want. Right. This is uh, great when you are in a complex proof. You can create visualizations for your mathematical objects and see them as you are trying to prove your, your results. Another uh, challenge is language. Nobody knows how formal mathematics should look like. There is no spec. Everybody is learning as we go. We are learning as we go. There are many components there. We have coercion, overload notation, implicit. There are so many different things. But the main challenge is there's no spec. Every new gadget must have a well-defined semantics. The community is always giving feedback. And to be honest, they overwhelm us with all the feedback. Sometimes some feedback is in the right direction, sometimes in the wrong direction. It's really challenging. Engineering, people ask sometimes, oh, you are a computer scientist. Uh, yes, but uh, we are also engineers, right? There's a lot of engineering in a system like that. Goes from, even for building, I mean, you want to build MathLib, you want to check every single thing in MathLib. This is like a build process. It's a complicated process. A package manager, right? MathLib today is a monorepo. It's great from, for many different reasons. It's a monorepo. It's a consistent view of mathematics. There's only one ring in MathLib. There's only one field. Everything, it's not like sometimes uh, computer science libraries that you have many different lists, many different arrays. You have implementations of the same thing in many different uh, packages. Here, you have only one thing, right? You have one ring, one field, one definition of real numbers, and so on. But it puts new challenges, right? Uh, we, it can be a monorepo forever, 
right? We need a package manager to progress. We need documentation generators. You need continuous integration. This part, actually, the community, I would never expect. The continuous integration from FLIB is like a professional software development environment. You get pull requests, you have reviews. There's a team of reviewers. They have more than 30 reviewers, people that checks if the contributions meet the quality criteria they want. Right. This is a lot. This is a lot. I mean, my point I'm trying to make in this slide is that this is a lot of engineering. Now let's to, to think. To, one, the hot topic now is AI, right? Everybody, there are many, many different groups trying to build AI for mathematics. We all know large language models are incredible, incredibly powerful tools, right? But they also hallucinate. Here's an example that a friend of mine uh, sent me uh, for fun. I mean, we were talking about, we were, I was excited telling him about large language models. He just sent me, oh, ask GPT-4 <laughs> this question. Show me that there are infinitely many integers between two distinct integers. And he comes up with <laughs> these arguments, right? Some people may be fooled and believe, whoa, there are infinite integers between any two distinct in in integers. It makes some sense. That, I mean, obviously, there are mistakes, right? So like in this if step. Follow, if we follow up, uh, trying to uh, make it admit its error. No, no, he just gave me this part. But uh, keep in mind. I find that GPT-4 actually can recover to some extent. No, but you have to understand, you have to go here. Now, you may believe this is true, these arguments, right? And accept it. Like, yeah, it's great. <laughs> So, uh, formal proofs is an antidote to hallucinations, right? And there are many different groups building AI for mathematics on top of Lean because we have a huge mathematical library. If you want to come up with a proof, a formal proof, this proof needs a lot of mathematics. It doesn't come uh, from thin air. You, have the, you, you need the definitions, the results, the theorems, right? And having a huge mathematical library is key. Right. That's why many groups are building AI for math on top of Lean, because you can create the, the, these formal proofs that can be checked, and we have a gigantic mathematical library. For example, OpenAI, a few years ago, they wrote a system on top of Lean that can solve some Olympiad problems, right? This one is from IMO 1964, problem two. The proof is very simple in Lean. It's using a piece of a tactic, NL, a riff, right? There is the magical step. He came up with these terms, right? This is the magic in, in, in this proof. Everything else is mechanical. But coming up with these terms was the was the uh, was machine using machine learning, right? That AI also built a system, right? And it was really well integrated with in Lean 3, right? Uh, in your proof, it would suggest many different tactics, what you should try next. There is also something called auto-formalization, the process of converting informal math into formal one. Of course, this is just a beginning. I mean, we're not there yet, but imagine a day that you can interact with this kind of system using informal mathematics. Everything's being converted to formal behind the scenes, right? This project here, Lean Chat, is the one of the first attempts, right? You start writing in English, it gives back the Lean version of this statement written in English, you keep interacting, you say, oh, this is not completely right, replace order by order off, and you keep interacting. There's also Lean Aid, right, where you can write a comment in English and ask it to convert the comments into Lean, uh, the Lean code for you. There's also Lean Dojo. This is from this year, right? It's a project done in Caltech. This is very impressive. But I think the most impressive thing that everything is open source. These previous projects, they have many components that you do, do not have access to. Here, everything, the data sets, the models, the code, everything is open source. You can rebuild 
Lean Dojo on your own machine. You can run it locally. You don't need to talk to a server. You can, if you have a machine with GPUs, if you have a, a new Mac, you can run Lean Dojo on your notebook. The model running in your GPU on your notebook. If you want to play with the model, you want to fine tune the model, you can. This is really cool because everything is open source. I think this is one of the first projects in this AI format where everything is open source. So there are many other groups working in AI for math for Lean. These are the ones that are public. They already published the results. They have websites. But there are many others. Just this week, I talked to three different groups that are building AI for Lean here in the Bay Area. There are many different opportunities for Lean, math, lib, and AI. Right. First one is we, we can get machine checkable proofs, no hallucination. Right. We have auto-formalization, right? The idea that you can convert English in formal math in formal one, enabling this technology to a completely new crowd, right? You can use AI to also refactor your proofs, change them, apply transformations, and you can have verified code synthesizers, right? These are, we see AI generating codes, but we don't know if the code does what we want. Imagine a future where the code comes, you give an spec, the AI gives you back the code and a proof that this, this code meets your specification. Or it gives back your code and it allows you to ask questions about the code. Does it have this property? And the AI says, yes, here's the certificate. This can change how we do math and computer science. There's also lots of community excitement. For example, uh, Thomas here, he wrote a system where you can write systems of differential equations, prove properties about these systems, and automatically get animations. Right. He did all because all that because Lean is extensible, right? He creates uh, this is a DSL he created for stating properties about your, his system. And then the stuff also, also generates the animation for you. Another cool thing is that one of a magician was really happy when he realized it, is that because formal math is data, right, you can refactor it. For example, suppose that we have a result that uh, uses uh, holds for fields. You can write a small script that try to replace everything that is, uh, is using a field with a ring and check if the proof still goes through. If the, still, the proof still goes through, you have generalized the results. Right. Is this cool, right? You can write these scripts and they actually generalize a bunch of things by just running scripts like that. And the coolest part is that we cannot just generalize the results, but you can propagate it, the generalization. Here he was pointing out, imagine you generalize a result from a paper written 50 years ago, and now you want to propagate the result to every single paper that depends on your paper. How do you do that? It's really hard to do that. With formal mathematics, you can do that with a push of a button. Right. The conclusion of the talk is like, Lean is extensible to your improver. You can find more about Lean on our website. You have many links to articles in popular science magazines, videos. Uh, it enables decentralized collaboration. I believe the MathLib community will change how mathematics is done and taught. Uh, the community is amazing, and one thing that's a message is not about proving. It's not about making sure your proof is correct. For mathematics, it's way more than that. It reduces your cognitive loads, allows you to understand complex objects and proofs, get new insights, and as Shosey says, when he quoted, when he saw the results, uh, of the, uh, when people formalize uh, his results, he said, formal mathematics allow us to navigate this thick jungle that's beyond our cognitive power. Thank you very much for your attention.
Yeah, thank you for that very inspiring talk. Uh, take questions. Thank you. Uh, first of all, thank you very much for coming to talk to us. I, I feel quite a bit emotional, like, uh, you know, I'm meeting Linus Torvalds in person. Uh, <laughs> can I ask you, so for those of us who don't exactly know that much about uh, Schultz's uh, liquid theorems and such, uh, if you go back maybe, I don't know, let's say 20 years, what would you say were other great successes of mechanical proof checking by Lean and maybe by others? Oh, yeah. Going back 20 years, Lean didn't even exist. Yeah. Well, but that many, for me, that many successes, right? For example, ComSearch in Coq, like ComSearch is this verified C compiler, right? It's an amazing achievement. Many influenced so many people in many different universities built on top of ComCert. There's also uh, uh, the Four Color Theorem, right, by George Gontier, a former colleague of mine at Microsoft, the Faye Thompson, also by George Gontier. There's also the Kepler conjecture from Tom Hales. And Tom Hales, I didn't have the opportunity to say, but he, he has a huge role in the Lean story. In 2017, Tom Hales gave a talk uh, at a, a seminar called Big Proof. And he said, I'm going to do my next project. He, he finished the Kepler conjecture and said, my next project, formal abstracts, I'm going to do using Lean. And the goal of the formal abstracts was his dream is that every paper in math would have a formal statement. The, the proof could be still being formal, but the statement would be formal. It will, he explains why this would enable so many different things. In that. And in that talk, Kevin Buzzard was there, right? And Kevin Buzzard decided to learn Lean because of that talk that Tom Hales gave. He said, if Tom's doing, I'm going to use Lean too. Oh, okay. And Kevin brought the perfect body spaces, everybody, right? So Tom, I'm super grateful for him. Yeah, so uh, Lin has such an incredible uh, user community. And uh, as you mentioned, that you didn't really intend that to happen, especially for mathematics. So looking back, uh, can you see why people gather around Lin? Uh, was it because of the design of a language or something else? I can only conjecture that. Right? One thing I think is extensibility, right? They could extend. They have so many extensions. Sometimes they say, oh, Leo, we hate the stuff you did. We create our own version. Yesterday, someone was telling me, Leo, why there's induction prime and induction? Why right? the two tactics that do almost the same thing. But induction prime is the community version. And they use induction prime. They tell me, I, your version sucks. <laughs> <laughs> we implemented our own version. Right. This way, they can make the system their own. They have a tactic. I have cases. They have R cases. They implement with so many gadgets and features. It would be impossible for me to do all these bells and whistles they wanted, but they could do themselves. Right. So I think giving this power to them made a big difference. There's a question here that comes back to you. Yeah, so maybe that's a little philosophical, my question. So uh, Lean can check proofs. Mm -hmm. With AI, you can create a proof and then have it checked by Lean. Yes. Is there a way to create theorems that AI will prove and then Lean will check? And in the end, the computers do, do their own math and we only yes. sit on, stand on the sidelines and watch them yes. do this? It's starting to show up uh, a few months ago in Nature. We had a result, right? The AI was postulating new conjectures, right? Things will happen more and more, but uh, I strongly believe, at least in my lifetime, we are going to have AI as assistants. They may be exploring conjectures, but they're not doing by themselves. They are working together. And I, I, I view AI as empowering us, right? They empower us in so many different ways. Computers empowers us. Imagine in the past, Gauss was an amazing, he knew how to calculate. He was a fast human calculator. Today, no human needs to be a, a fast human calculator to be a great mathematician. Kevin Buzzard tells me that every math department has a 
problem solver, someone that got a gold medal in the IMO. They are like this, they know how to solve these puzzles, right? But suppose that you don't have access to a puzzle solver, you are stuck. Right? Maybe you may be brilliant, but you are not a good puzzle solver, you are not a good human calculator. Computers enable you, AI will enable one day to you overcome these puzzles automatically. The same way with computers, we don't need to be a human calculator anymore. Right? The empowering us, maybe one day they will replace, I don't know, I mean, but I don't think this will happen in my lifetime. Hello, thank you for an interesting talk. Uh, my name is Yawa Dokantas. I'm a visiting PhD at Stanford University. And I'm really, after your talk, excited of about trying out Lean. My question is related with its implementations and capabilities for uh, nonlinear um, mm -hmm. arithmetics for real numbers. Mm -hmm. And some motivation behind my question is that over the past few years, I can relate to the problems that you mentioned in the beginning of your presentation, that some of the proof steps on pen and paper are missing in information theory and probabilities. and um, Interactive uh, proof assistants are not too intuitive mm -hmm. in this case. And SMT solvers, when working with uh, nonlinearity for reals, are also not conver converging. Uh, mm -hmm. There was some promising uh, DREAL4 implementation that might have worked, mm -hmm. but it has some numerical instability. So I'm wondering if I'm a researcher who'd like to try out Lean, what would you suggest and mm -hmm. recommend? Uh, in similar problems. Yeah, for, uh, yeah it's interesting. Yes, uh, I mean, you, you, if you, the SMT solvers, SMT solvers, they use cylindrical algebraic decomposition. Uh, it's powerful technique, but as you said, sometimes times out. Today is the, is the best automation we have for nonlinear arithmetic. In proof of systems, unfortunately, cylindrical algebraic decomposition it's still open problem to get a proof, a compact proof certificate for this. The same way time is out is, is ginormous a proof certificate that this kind of solver produces. This is a challenge. Uh, but there are some, some lights in the end of the tunnel. For example, uh, last year, uh, a group at Brown University by Rob Lewis, they connected Link to a computer algebra system for computing global basis. The cool thing about the global base is that the certificates are compact. Yes. So you can call an untrusted system that computes the global basis. And now you can check. There is an efficient way to check if it's correct or not, the results. So you can, they implement this bridge. And uh, uh, they presented in a summary school at Brown. If you search for it, uh, it's really fun to see the students. I mean. Heather Macbeth was giving the lecture and she starts asking people to solve these nonlinear problems by themselves and they start struggling. And suddenly she said, okay, let me show you a proof automation. And she shows and people start cheering in the room. And, and one person comes to me and says, wow, I never see mathematicians cheering during a presentation. <laughs> Yeah, that lights in the but this is still a challenge. Yes. Thank you. Yeah. So maybe more like general question. So when you're reading proofs, some proofs are beautiful, like they're proofs from the book. Some are like really ugly. Both of them are correct. So does Lean come with the notion of like beautiful, you know, like beauty? Ah, uh, well, the math the math lib community they have their notions of beauty, right? Some pull requests will be rejected, right? Saying this proof is a mess, right? Uh, for MathLib, the main important thing is maintainability, right? Can we maintain this proof, right? I think it's the main notion of beauty there. And of course, they have coding conventions, naming conventions. It's like uh, uh, the same techniques we use for writing code. What's the name? Are you following the, our naming conventions? Are you following our coding conventions? For example, I like really long lines. In MathLib, they will not take my codes. I mean, because I use really long lines and they want 80 lines. You, you can cross eight, uh, not, uh, eight columns, sorry. 
you cannot have more than eight characters in one line. You have to break because they want to make things readable. I, I tell people, well, why don't you buy a bigger monitor? <laughs> <laughs> Hello. Um, so let's say I have a tweet or a more interesting uh, agent, a agent that's used large language models. Can I use foundational model that creates embedding of uh, a tweet or words in this tweet? We treat each embedding as a symbol and we try to create a lean code out of those symbols and see if the construct a proof and see if the proof well, converges so it does not converge, right? Or whatever, if it's true or not. Okay. Uh, does it sound for you as a reasonable way to address reasoning problems with LLMs? I'm not an expert in machine learning, right? Uh, I'm more, when I talk to machine learning people, I always ask them which APIs from me you want. I can expose the internals, for example, I help them providing the internals of uh, the proof states, the data structures. They want to access the internal information to be able to train the machine learning models. But I have very little intuition how these machine learning models work. Sometimes they blow me away. I cannot even understand when I play with GPT-4, how come it can do that? I can't really give you any guidance about machine learning. I can put you in touch with colleagues of mine that are experts in machine learning for, for math, uh, but myself, I can really comment. Sounds plausible what you said, but I don't know. I'll give it to him. Yes. So I'm wondering, a lot of lean is about proofs, but I feel like maybe in mathematical reasoning, you also think a lot about examples and maybe counterexamples. Mm -hmm. Is there some place in lean where you can incorporate something like, I try to prove a theorem and instead lean comes back and says, oh, this theorem is actually wrong. Here is a counterexample or, or maybe even something more subtle than that. Well, we want counterexamples. We don't have good support for counterexamples now. There's a tool like a quick check in lean. But this is only for simple things, right? Only builds counterexamples for very simple things. For cutting edge mathematics, things are so abstract that constructing a counterexample would be gigantic objects, right? You saw that you have uh, that statement I, I showed, you have to build a commutative ring, you have to build a ring, you have to build a submodule, you have to build so many things for the counterexample uh, it's quite tricky for uh, maybe in the future we'll have tools to do that. You can like, oh, from these instances of ring, commutative ring, try to build a counterexample using these instances. Like I'm feeding you some examples of these mathematical objects and ask the system to build a counterexample using them. I can see that working. But working from thin air, I would be really surprised. Yeah, so in a sense, Lin is realizing the uh, the dream of uh, David Hilbert uh, 100 years ago, which is build this me mechanical foundation of, of mathematics. Uh, but then Good also came along saying that you can't do that. Like, mm -hmm. you can't have a consistent formal system that's all powerful. So, like, what is the limitation of Lin? Uh, and for sure, for sure. I mean, we will hit problems that we have to extend the, lean, the, the foundations, right, to be able to attack. This may happen, right? But in practice, this incompleteness is not a big deal, right? We have very few results, incompleteness results in mathematics, real ones, right? The example that Gödel built is very artificial, right? We hit real results, right? The independence of the continuous hypothesis, right? But these are exceptional results, right? In, in, in real mathematics, this is not a real thing. Of course, one day we may have to increase the power of the foundation, right? But we hope the same, we hope that when this kind of thing happens in the future, right, we will be able to m move the mathematical library automatically to the new foundation, right? Uh, 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 it's, uh, key in mind that even if we don't have to increase the foundation, 
no system will exist forever. Right? Programming languages die, one day Lean will die and something else will replace it. Right? Even if the foundation is the same, but it's a better system. Like we have programming languages that are both too incomplete, but one is more convenient to use. I strongly believe that nothing's forever. Lean will be replaced by something that has a stronger foundation or something is better, better usability, better scalability. Hopefully, the mathematical library will be ported <laughs> automatically to the new system. Um, so you, in your talk, you have this nice uh, tweet or something from uh, Graydon, and you also mentioned that you know when you initially created Lean or Lean 4, I can't remember, your your priority was not a uh, language for mathematics or even an uh, interactive theorem prover, but uh, you know a better general purpose programming language in many ways. And uh, we saw one example of a sort of export um, from the development of, of Lean with this uh, functional blend in place stuff. This is sort of a sort of general technique in programming languages, and I, I think it's getting implemented in some others. So how do you see going forward with the Lean FRO or even your personal priorities managing the sort of Lean as a language, as a programming language, a you know, general purpose programming language, mm -hmm. versus Lean as the you know tool for math lib or the tool for mathematic, mathematics more broadly? Yes. Uh, right now, in the FRO, we have two missions. We want to support the mathematical community, right? And we want to achieve self-sustainability. What do we mean by achieving self-sustainability? We want to have industrial applications, but in five years, the only thing that we think we can do is to have Lean as a system that's for software verification and hardware verification. Companies, uh, we hope in five years, we're going to have Lean being users in many software companies, hardware companies to verify hardware and software, and they will be donating money to the Lean Foundation, right? That's our goal. Maybe in 10 years, we can have Lean as our mainstream programming language. But this is really complex effort, right? To get, to get a system at the level that is a mainstream programming language. Python took more than one decade to be a mainstream programming language. Rust, same thing, right? Hopefully one day we'll get there, but don't hold your breath. <laughs> All right, uh, thank you for the great talk. Um, I wanted to ask, so you said some of the users of Lean are students, um, and you said like even like younger students. So I was wondering, like, let's say at the undergraduate level, right? Like let's say you have an undergraduate come in, they're learning computer science, they're taking discrete math. Should they, should we like allied like problem sets entirely? Should we just say, write your proofs in Lean because you'll become a better not only programmer, but also a mathematician somehow. Yes. Uh, uh, for example, there are lecture notes like, when people ask me this question, I always point them to Heather's Macbeth course. She taught for second year his students at Fordham. Her lecture notes are beautiful. I mean, I think every student will learn, will understand the proofs better by following her lecture notes. Right? She has many exercises. He, she reduces the power of the proof automation to make sure the students are learning. They're not just using proof automation. She has a really nice setup where she reduces the power of the system to motivate students to learn to create proofs by hand. Can I intervene? Uh, so this is not such an abstract topic. Uh, uh, I teach uh, discrete math at the uh, University of Pennsylvania. And uh, my colleague Benjamin Pierce, a couple of years ago, uh, proposed, uh, why do we teach discrete math as math? Why don't we teach it in Coq? Mm -hmm. uh, and guess who was very much against it? <laughs> the algorithms people, the very theoretical, not, you know, systems people, the very theoretical algorithms people who do not see any kind of rhyme between between a book formalization of a proof and what they would write as a proof. I know this full of algorithms people. Yes. Yes. I will <laughs> try to escape through that door. <laughs> and what they would write as, as a proof in, in, say, their paper, right? They, they feel that, that the kind of uh, attention to detail and, uh, is, is counterproductive. Mm -hmm. And so, I'm still teaching discrete math for algorithms rather than discrete math for, for programming language theory. I see, I see. 
No, it just... Uh, don't, don't hold your breath, whoever asked that question. <laughs> um, so you mentioned that the math lib... Uh, oh. Yeah, sorry. The, uh, the math lib uh, file is millions of lines of code, and I imagine hundreds of thousands of, of theorems. Yeah. So how would a user who's writing a theorem and, and wants to use a, a previously proven theorem, how would they go about finding it in, in there? I imagine discoverability is, is kind of an issue. Yes, yes. Uh, and people are working on that, right? There are people working using AI, like the Beta AI example I gave. There are people that uh, just define, you're putting fragments of the name and you can search, you have fuzzy matcher in Yin. You can put fragments of the name of the term and hope you're going to find it. There's now a new tool called Lugo that is like a search engine for Lean where you can ask, give me terms that you use, for example, sine and cosine. You will return a list of terms that mention these two functions, right? Uh, but people, this is an active area, right? Uh, and this is a big, if you ask anybody using formal mathematics, it's the same thing when you're using a big software library. You spend a lot of time trying to find functions in the library. Same thing in MathLib. You spend a lot of time trying to find theorems in the library. But people are working on tools. Math is data, right? You can write tools for searching the library. Um, the, on the bulletin board of NASA. <laughs> <laughs> yes, this is a good technique too. Sure yes, practice. yes, yes. They claim that's the best search engine. You go there and type the question. They say, yes, it's here. Um, hello, everyone. I'm a freshman here at Berkeley math major. I happen, I'm, I happen to take like math 55, which is discrete math right now. So I'm like a perfect example of like students uh, who could use lean. So my question is that, like, is there any feature for like intuitive ideas, like improves? Because like, for example, we're now like learning number theory. It's like the first proofs come to our uh, class is like prove like there are infinite ma infinitely many primes. Mm -hmm. And then there are such like steps in, in the proof that like it feels like it's totally made up by someone who is like mm -hmm. so smart. It was, it was like 100 times <laughs> smarter than me. And like, there's no like motivation for that. So is there any like a feedback loop in Lean that will, will tell me like, what's the like idea behind this step, like step by step so, so that I can learn this process better? Well, this is great. I mean, same thing happens in programming, right? Sometimes you're reading a program, how they came up with that. Sometimes they put in a comment explaining why, how they came up. Right, but the cool thing about the infinite primes, there are YouTube videos with people showing how to prove the infinite primes in Lean. Right, there is one magical step. Right, uh, and they will tell you in the YouTube video how they how they did it. I mean, uh, but in general, yes. I mean, it would be great if people document this kind of intuition in their proofs. Maybe AI will help us one day. To, to explain the intuition behind a step. But in principle, people can write a magical term. I do, remember the IMO example where it came up with three terms, parameters for, for that piece of proof automation. You may ask, how did it came up with this A minus B here, B minus C and C minus A? Yeah, it would be great if this information is there in the file too, maybe in the form of a comment, but in principle, the same thing can happen. All mathematics, by definition, does not solve this problem. It's up to the person writing the proof to document this, how they came up with this term. Okay, so it's almost seven, so maybe one final question. Yeah, uh, yeah you said that uh, it can be um, uh, sort of a lengthy, lengthy process because to, to formalize the proof because you can't just say something is obvious. Uh, so do people like, um, you know, uh, temporarily say that this step is like an action or like this implication is an action? And so you can sort of gradually go from. Yes. Uh, in, in Lean, there's something called sorry. It's like saying, this is, this is sorry, uh, this step, trust me. Of course, you can, uh, in MathLib, they will never take your PR if it has sorries. But in your machine, you can keep, in your, in your, you can fork. 
and save your intermediate results full of sorries there. Uh, but I, I see people discussing, oh, there are only five sorries left. <laughs> and sometimes it's funny, they remove one sorry but put two. <laughs> it's like, it's a fight. Uh, but people get really excited when they remove all sorries. And many of them, they come to me and say, wow, you built the best video game ever. <laughs> All right, so thank you so much, yes, Leonardo, for you. a great talk. And the extensive...